All right. Hey, Spartans. Um, I am Sonia Suckup, and I'm going to be presenting some information to you all tonight on anxiety. Um, I want to thank Ms. Johnson and Steph for reaching out and asking me to do this. Um, I wish I could be there in person. Um, if you all figure out a way to teleport or transport in a way easier way, <laughs> let me know um, so we can do more of these. Uh, but I'm very excited to be here tonight, and let's go ahead and get started. Um, share this here. All right, so my credentials are licensed mental health practitioner and certified professional counselor. And what those basically mean is it just allows me to offer um, counseling and therapy to students, faculty, staff, um, anybody that may need my service. Um, and I am so very, very, very happy um, to be present in Boyd County supporting um, education and being able to work with kids and teachers. Um, so this is a, a recent photo of me on a trip that I made to New York. And I think it's so funny because I did kind of a lot of touristy things. And one of them was going to the Empire State Building. And the day that we picked, it was rainy and snowy. <laughs> And there was no view. There was absolutely no view on the lookout tower. Um, and this is me just reminding everyone that even when you can't see the views, life will go on. It will be okay. It will be okay. <laughs> All right. So let's dive in. We're going to talk about anxiety. Um, so anxiety is essentially um, a mental and physical reaction to perceived threats. Um, those threats can be real or imagined. Um, I think it's really important to know when we're talking about anxiety that um, it's a very real condition. It's a very real thing that at some point in time, I think everyone experiences um, and symptoms can range depending on what the person is experiencing. Um, so, but it's, some symptoms can include uncontrollable worry, upset stomach, sleep problems, poor concentration, mental tension, avoidance of fear. Um, honestly, those symptoms can, can be expanded, um, in students, oftentimes it presents itself as physical symptoms. So upset stomach, headache, um, a desire to want to go home, um, and avoidance of tasks, avoidance of things that may be anxiety provoking. So, um, on the other side of the screen here, I have this interesting upside down triangle looking thing. And um, a lot of my background is in trauma and understanding how trauma impacts the brain. And um, Dr. Bruce Perry, very, very formative man in terms of shaping my understanding of trauma in the brain. Um, he developed this visual that I, I kind of use in all my presentations because I think it is so profound and it is so important for us to understand how the brain is functioning to explain some of these symptoms that people experience. So I'm gonna take a crack at explaining this to you all and I hope it makes sense. If not, shoot me an email and I'd be more than happy to expand on this. Um, so we're gonna start at the brainstem, the red part. Um, this, this is the first thing to develop in the brain and is the most essential for us to be alive, right? It performs all of those automatic functions that we don't have to think about. So it reminds our heart to beat, it reminds our lungs to breathe, regulates our body temperature, blood pressure, all of those really, really critical parts to just simply staying alive. Um, as we move up to the yellow area, this is called the midbrain or sometimes the diencephalon. Uh, but this part of the brain is really helping us make sense of um, our environments, helping us kind of differentiate between what's happening on the outside world and the inside world. Um, other things that are really essential for um, that part of the brain are um, appetite and sleep. We're going to talk about sleep in a moment, um, but very, very essential uh, to meeting needs in that area of the brain as well. Um, and then we move up to the green area. In this area, you may have heard fight, flight, freeze, or um, the lizard brain, um, the limbic midbrain and brainstem are often clumped together and referred to as the old brain or the lizard brain. Um, again, the, the functions of these parts of the brain is truly just survival. It is getting through. 
um, the green part of the brain is where those essential elements that keep us safe reside. Um, there's an important part called the amygdala. Um, I always kind of refer to it as, as the, the brave warrior in your brain or the thing in your brain that's scanning for danger. It's, it's looking for perceived or real threat. Um, and then if the brain responds to that, it will respond. Um, so what happens is, let's say, um, let's say you're driving down the road. You're in Boyd County and you're driving down the road and out of the corner of your eye, you spot a deer, okay? Um, I know there's, they say you're not supposed to swerve, but it's, I always do. I can't help it <laughs> uh, because the limbic part of my brain takes over. It says, whoa, danger, Sonia. Uh, I slam on the brakes. I try to avoid everything. My heart is pounding outside of my chest and my stomach drop, drops to my toes. So slowing that process down a little bit, what is essentially happening is the limbic area is responding to true perceived threat and immediately releases adrenaline to all of the functions in my body that is necessary for survival. So it's sending adrenaline to my muscles to be strong. It's sending um, hyper-focus to my eyes to be able to truly see and, and find a path toward safety. Um, and it's, it's cutting out those functions that are not 100% necessary for survival in that moment. moment. Uh, so it's slowing down or stopping digestion. Um, oh, and another thing it does is it speeds up your heart rate in order to increase your blood flow to your muscles, get things working, right? So if you can recall a time where you've experienced that, you may be able to say, wow, yeah, I definitely experienced some of those physical symptoms. And it takes a minute until my heart slows down and the tingling goes away from my muscles and my stomach doesn't hurt anymore. So um, that process is critical because it, it is for survival. Um, but when we're talking about things in school um, and how anxiety relates to school, um, the adults in the room can understand that school is truly a safe place for kids to be. It's an important place for kids to be. And if, if their limbic area is responding, such as we're seeing a deer out of the corner of our eyes when we're driving, um, it's really important that, that we're supporting students in being able to calm those perceived threats and help them perform at um, appropriate states of arousal, right? So that's the limbic area. Uh, the finally, the last area that makes us most uniquely human um, and is truly the only area of the brain that we have control over is the cortical area. Um, I always, when I'm talking, I teach this to kids a lot and um, I always kind of refer to this as the super smart part of the brain. This is where we use logic and reason and abstract thought, and it allows us to formulate opinions. And the blue part of the brain is very essential to be online when kids are in school learning. Here's the tricky part though. The brain works from the bottom up, meaning if there's something very, very active or escalated in the brainstem, the brain's gonna go right down to survival mode. If there's something not making sense or a little wonky in the midbrain, everything's going down to the midbrain. If we're having a perceived sense of threat, everything is gonna go down to the limbic midbrain brainstem. And it really restricts access to the cortical part of the brain. Um, if you have, if you can think about a time with your children where they, they've done something and you're like, what were you thinking? And they're like, I don't know. I mean, the truth is if it was an intense situation, they probably weren't thinking because they were really restricted in their cortical region. They were restricted in their ability to use, to use logical thought, rational thought, um, those higher um, brain elements. So um, that is kind of brain function in a nutshell and how um, anxiety and its function can really get in the way of learning and can also get in the way of daily operational things that, um, that we need in order to be really well-functioning people. So this, we, we can't talk about anxiety if we don't just touch on test anxiety, okay? Um, 
Test anxiety is a very real thing. Um, people may experience this in different levels and capacities and may have different symptoms associated. Um, but when you take a step back and you think about it, um, test anxiety has a lot of elements. So first of all, if there is underlying anxiety to begin with, this is a perceived threat, correct? It's, it's an intense situation. There are some expectations. Um, but if there isn't perceived threat prior to that, and it's just simply the idea of taking a test, um, you can understand that there's some pressure to perform well, um, not wanting to fail the test, not wanting to do poorly, wanting to do well, wanting to demonstrate mastery of the skills, um, some uncertainty. So we are, we are creatures of habit. Um, a little tip that we'll talk about also is predictability, knowing what to expect helps us calm down. And um, not every test is the same. In fact, every test we take has different content, different covering different measures. And the uncertainty of that can also cause some anxiety. Um, there are other things that can go along with, with test anxiety, but I think we can all understand some of the reasons of why it happens in the first place. Um, some of the physical symptoms that people can, can report is feeling really sweaty, really hot, mind going blank, um, not really sure, um, heart pounding outside of their chest. Again, makes sense based on our previous conversation of, of what happens in the brain when we're, we're experiencing a perceived threat. So I wanna take a moment to explain to you this triangle here. Um, this is oftentimes referred to as a cognitive triangle. Um, and I'm not trying to steal this. This comes from therapist aid from a, from a graphic or a handout that I use quite often there. Um, but I want to walk you through this because it's it's very simple to explain to kids and you can do um, really simple coaching with them um, if they're experiencing anxiety or test anxiety to help them feel a bit more calm. Um, so I'm going to explain this quickly. So um, our brain works in a nutshell of having thoughts, feelings, and we do things, right? Um, I'm going to simply define each of these. So thoughts are things we think. Thoughts are not always facts. Um, that can get us into trouble sometimes if we're thinking something and it feels like a fact, but in fact, it's not a fact. <laughs> um, so thoughts are simply just things that we think. Uh, feelings are the emotions that we have or the emotions that we experience and actions are the things that we do. So each one of these can impact the, uh, the other. Um, so um, I always use this, this example with kids. So um, it, right away in the morning, my alarm clock goes off and my initial action is to press the snooze button because <laughs> I am not ready to get up. Um, and as I'm pressing the snooze button, I'm thinking, oh, I'm so tired. And then I check in with my feeling and I'm feeling tired. And then I close my eyes and go back to sleep for like two minutes. And then my alarm clock goes off again and I can't press the snooze button. I have to get up. So my action is so thinking again, no, Sonia, you have to get up. My action is get out of bed, um, feeling still tired. Then I go back to actions. I start my morning routine, um, predictability, right? Um, and routine. Uh, and then I'm thinking, okay, all right, all right. We're, we're getting busy. We're getting, getting awake, getting oriented to what the temperature is and starting to think about what I'm going to wear, um, wanting to be comfortable, those types of things. Um, and then by like midway through my morning routine, I am starting to think about coffee. <laughs> I am a coffee junkie. So uh, that um, inspires an action, go to the coffee pot, turn it on, feeling good. Um, so with that example, you can kind of see how it flows back and forth and how they can, they can interact with one another. What happens with anxiety is I think our, our feelings and our thoughts get really stuck um, and can result in either overaction or underaction. Um, so for example, if we're thinking on a test, I am going to do poorly, or I am not ready for this test, or I am going to fail this test. Again, just thoughts, not facts. Um, and then may, that may lead to feelings of anxiety or fear or, um, feeling very uncertain. Um, what I encourage you to do or to talk to kids about is to challenge those thoughts. Thoughts are so powerful. 
thoughts can literally change the way that we feel. Um, so for, in for instance, if you're noticing that a student is feeling nervous, um, you might say something to them like, um, I see that you're feeling a bit nervous. I can see that you're a bit nervous. I need you to remember that um, you have studied hard for this, you have prepared for this, and you will do the best that you can. I know that, right? You're offering them reassurance. Um, you are challenging that thought in a moment because where they were originally thinking, I'm going to do poorly on this, you're giving them every reason why they will do okay, right? Um, and going back to only tell them what's true. Don't don't uh, tell them that they're gonna get a 100 if you know that they're not going to get a 100, right? Um, so challenging some of those anxious thoughts and encouraging kids to be open about their feelings. Um, being nervous or anxious or um, worried um, are oftentimes really hard feelings to share um, and they can be very isolating feelings. So really encouraging kids to be honest about how they're feeling and take time to role model that. Um, I think one of the coolest things to witness is when kids have those aha moments where they see adults doing something which gives the students then permission to do that as well, um, especially if it's a positive skill. I think that's just really, really, really powerful. Um, and as parents, you guys can role model that all the time, whether it's anxious or all the feelings, essentially. You get to role model appropriate ways of handling those feelings and being honest that everybody has these feelings and it's okay. It's okay to share them and, and you can get supported in these feelings. So that, that's the triangle in a nutshell. And again, it's, it's challenging some of those really negative thoughts that lead to anxious feelings or uncomfortable feelings and reminding them to challenge those thoughts to, to be what is accurate and true and reflect the facts. So I wanna talk for a moment about some buffers to anxiety. Um, I think these can be generalized to anxiety, test anxiety, any type of anxiety you're experiencing. Um, the first one is um, regulatory opportunity. And what I mean by that is essentially anything that is patterned, predictable, or routine. Um, so examples might be chewing gum, listening to music, walking, running. Um, the whole theory behind this is that when babies are in utero, um, growing and developing, uh, their senses are still developing, but the ways that they can understand and know that they're safe is by their mother's heartbeat. It's felt and heard. And so then when babies are born, what do we naturally do to soothe them? We might rock them, we might pat their back, we might feed them. All of those things are predictable, repetitive, and routine. Um, so Think outside of the box. I mean, we all do things, right? I bet right now, um, the I could, if I were there, I'd scan the room and somebody's tapping their knee, somebody's chewing gum, uh, somebody's maybe got a pen and they're twirling it. <laughs> um, we, we've all kind of got things that we do. Um, I would share this one. Um, I cannot have pens with plastic caps as evidenced by the little thing that's broken off of this one. <laughs> um, so this is just something that I've, gravitated towards naturally didn't really don't realize I'm doing it but when I have pen caps with the the steel um, little clip thing um, I'll put it on my finger and tap I don't know why I do this I mean I know why I do this but um, it's just it's regulating for me it, it makes me feel calm and um, it's patterned routine rhythmic it works so creating a lot of opportunities for kids to experience and engage in those things um, cognitive restructuring. So that's just a fancy way of saying challenging those negative thoughts and asking kids what they're thinking, asking them what their what their thoughts are that are making them feel worried or anxious. Um, and then supporting them through that process of the, so that's what your thought is, but what are the facts here? And what do we know for certain? Um, and then um, really, really helping them come up with some positive thoughts for um, what the truth is. Um, safe connection with people that we love. Um, I read a really great book this summer. I would encourage you all to pick it up, audio, audio book it, whatever you can. Um, it's called What Happened to You. It was a Bruce Perry and Oprah book. Um, and 
Bruce just talks basically throughout the whole book about how, how loving connection is truly medicine. Um, spending time with people that we love and care about in a safe way is the best way to help us regulate as human beings. And when I say regulate, I mean, come back to this state of calm, come back to this state of being okay. That's where our brains and our bodies naturally want to be. Um, and so if I'm saying that word, that's what I mean. Um, routine, again, having some predictable elements to their, their daily life routine is all about knowing what to expect. That is calming. Um, I a hundred percent need that. I, if I don't have a planner and if, or if I don't have a, a sheet in front of me telling me what my day looks like, even though I might have the exact same, uh, Thursday that I've had for months now, get a little anxious. Like I just need to, to see it, to know what's going to, what's going to come next. Um, and it's a very calming thing. Um, reassurance, offering reassurance whenever possible, um, and offering realistic reassurance. If you don't know that it's going to be okay, do not say that, um, go off of factual things that you know, to be true, that can be reassuring statements. Like, um, we will get through this together. I use that one a lot with kids, um, especially when they're having really big feelings, because it is true. I will be with them until that feeling passes and until they are okay. Um, so we will get through this together. Um, I am here to root for you. Um, I love you so much. I will be thinking of you. Um, I know that you will do the absolute best that you can do. Um, those types of reassuring thoughts can really do wonders for, for calming some of those anxious thoughts. Um, this next one, man, will I catch a lot of flack for this? <laughs> um, but truly, truly setting some limits on technology, um, especially on social media and video games. I know there's just not a super ton of research out there um, on uh, lots of technology time, um, but professionally, my position is less is better um, just because um, our brains and our bodies were not built for the constant um, inflow of, of stimulation that technology offers. And especially for young kids, it's a lot. It's a lot. And in it, in itself, um, just recently, Facebook got in trouble because they somewhat acknowledged that, um, I think it was Instagram was damaging for teens mental health. And, um, I 100% see that in my daily interactions with students. So, um, not saying that they, that students can't spend time on those things, but really truly just setting some appropriate limits um, for the age of your child. Uh, next one is mindfulness. Um, <laughs> I love it when I ask kids if they know what this is and their response is always the, um, uh, which yeah, that, that, that's mindfulness, but um, mindfulness is just so much more than that. Mindfulness can, can just simply be being able to notice what's, what's going on inside and outside of your body. Um, just being, having this, this level of awareness where, um, you are increasing your awareness, right? Um, so mindfulness might be recognizing when your heartbeat starts to increase and taking some deep breaths or noticing when you are feeling anxious and telling a trusted and caring grown up. um, Guys, tons and tons of stuff on mindfulness on the old internet. Internet. If you're looking for something specific, please reach out to me, and I would love to guide you in getting getting those resources. But um, really good stuff out there. Um, focusing on balance. Um, you know, I don't know why. I might know why, but I don't know why. Um, a lot of people will always ask my opinion <laughs> about um, you know the the best way to raise kids. And I think it all comes back to balance, right? Um, I don't think it's super helpful uh, to have kids involved in every single activity. Um, but I also think that being involved in those activities, some of those activities is very beneficial for kids. Um, so really truly finding balance and, and what is necessary or appropriate for your child. Um, you are experts of your kids. And although I could tell you one thing about your child, um, you're the experts. So, so know that and advocate for that. And, um, you know, just, just find balance in ways that make sense to you, your family and your children. And then finally, this may be the most important one. And that is just 
getting those basic needs in, um, food, water, and sleep. Safe shelter too. <laughs> um, sleep is the most underestimated tool in terms of combating any type of emotional or behavioral issue with, with a child. Um, sleep is just such an essential piece of our well being. So um, I'll use an example of when we go to sleep, it is like the street sweepers coming through and it's getting rid of junk that we don't need. And it's filing away or putting in the filing cabinets, things that are really important. And when the, sweep, when the street sweepers don't come through, then things start to pile up and it gets really messy and it doesn't flow as good. And all of a sudden your streets are packed full of stuff and nobody can get through. And then people are getting angry and it's just not a good scene. Um, that applies to adults too, guys. Um, when we are getting inadequate sleep, um, our temperaments directly impact how our kids will think and feel and behave. Um, so sleep is so essential. Um, if you have any questions regarding sleep, um, the American Sleep Foundation, their website has a ton of really great information and resources. I would encourage you to check that out. Um, or you can always talk to your pediatrician. They're really great um, guides of if you have sleep questions or um, your, your child is having sleep issues or anything like that. Um, water, man, it is so important, um, in order for our brains to be at peak performance, we need, we need a certain amount of water, right? Um, so making sure that, um, we're getting hydrated. It's just really important. Um, and then of course, food, making sure that we're getting a good balanced diet. We're getting some fruits, some veggies, um, and some treats, right? It's all about balance, all about balance. Um, there are many, many other anxiety buffers out there, um, but these I think are just some of the most important ones that can be um, easily navigated with you and your, and your children. So I wanna end with some resources. Um, I, I was gonna flood this with resources. I'm like, Sonia, you're silly. Like they are not gonna write all this down. So if I had top three, top three resources for you, one would be a book called Hey Warrior by Karen Young. I have purchased this book and it does such a great job of explaining anxiety to kids and helping them develop ideas of how to calm that limbic area of the brain to, to be able to access that cortical region much better. Um, another site that I strongly recommend for anything child related really is childsmind.org. Um, it's kind of my encyclopedia whenever I have questions or need some guidance on something. I'm always looking something up on child mind. Um, they have a really great section on technology as well. So if you're looking for what would be appropriate limits for my student, um, they have all that information on there. So it'd be really good. Um, and then this YouTube link is probably my favorite uh, video for teaching kids how to take a deep breath. Um, deep breathing is the number one hated coping skill <laughs> that I teach to kids. But the reason why I continue to teach it is because it is so helpful when it can be done. And let me explain the science behind it. So a really great deep breath is you're going to exhale, breathe out longer than you inhale. And the reason behind that is we have these kind of systems built into our body. So the sympathetic system is that green area, fight, flight, you're slamming on the brakes when the deer is out of the corner of your eye. And then we have the parasympathetic, which is the system in our body that helps put everything back in place. It's helping us calm down. It's reminding our hearts, it's okay, we're safe, we're good. It, it sends cues to our stomach. It's okay, you can, you can digest food again because we're safe, we're good. Um, so a deep breath is the number one thing that I think if I can teach everyone to do that as a society, we would be much calmer. <laughs> Um, but this YouTube is of a puffer fish and, um, the puffer fish is taking equal, um, equal counts, breaths in and breaths out, which, is, which is fine. But, um, I think it's just a really great visual to help people start getting in the practice of what a deep breath feels like, what a good deep breath feels like. And it's super fun to watch. Kids are pretty entertained by this. Um, so with that, um, if you guys have any questions, um, maybe offer those to Cindy and she can get them to me or um, Cindy, feel free to offer my email to folks. I wanna make sure that I'm answering any questions that, that exist out there. Um, I am in Boyd County every Thursday. Um, I'm 
pretty busy. <laughs> so if you stop by, I, I can't guarantee that I'll get to chat with you. Um, but anyway, um, again, I want to thank um, Cindy and Steph for inviting me to come and do this. And I hope this presentation was helpful and useful and a, and a good resource for you. So thank you, everyone, and have a good rest of your evening. Bye.